This is Soft Horrible Bites. Hello and welcome to another episode of Soft Wearable Bites. This is the show where I read to you articles and blog posts on subjects like software and cloud engineering and architecture, site reliability engineering, DevOps, and everything in between. Today, I have quite a long article, so I'll read it in three parts. The article is titled The Service Mesh, what every software engineer needs to know about the world's most overhyped technology, by William Morgan of Boyant.io. The Service Mesh What every software engineer needs to know about the world's most overhyped technology by William Morgan of Boyant.io Part 1 Introduction If you're a software engineer working anywhere near backend systems, the term Service Mesh has probably infiltrated your consciousness sometime over the past few years. Thanks to a strange confluence of events, this phrase has been rolling around the industry like a giant katamari ball, glomming on successively bigger pieces of marketing and hype and showing no signs of stopping at any time soon. The service mesh was born in the murky trend-infested waters of the cloud-native ecosystem which unfortunately means that a huge amount of service mesh content ranges from low-calorie fluff to, to use a technical term, basically bull****. But there is some real, concrete, and important value to the service mesh, if you can cut through all the noise. In this guide, I'm going to attempt just that, to provide an honest, deep, engineering-focused guide to the service mesh. I'm going to cover not just the what, but also the why and the why now. Finally, I'm going to attempt to describe why I think this particular technology has attracted such a crazy level of hype, which is an interesting story in and of itself. Who am I? Hi there, I'm William Morgan. I am one of the creators of Flinkerd, the very first service mesh project and the project that gave birth to the term Service Mesh itself. Sorry. I'm also the CEO of Boyant, a startup that builds cool Service Mesh stuff like Linkerd and Boyant Cloud. As you might imagine, I'm very biased and have some strong opinions on this topic. That said, I'm going to do my best to leave the editorializing to a minimum, except one section. Why do people talk so much about this? Where I'll unveil some opinions. And I'll do my best to write this guide in a way that is as objective as possible. When I need concrete examples, I'll primarily rely on Linkerd. But when there are differences I know about with other service mesh implementations, I'll call them out. Okay, on to the good stuff. What is a service mesh? For all the hype, the service mesh is architecturally pretty straightforward. It's not more than a bunch of underspace proxies stuck next to your services. We'll talk about what next means in a bit, plus a set of management processes. The proxies are referred to as the service mesh's data plane and the management processes as its control plane. The data plane intercepts calls between services and does stuff with these calls. The control plane coordinates the behavior of the proxies and provides an API for you, the operator, to manipulate and measure the mesh as a whole. What are these proxies? They are Layer 7 aware TCP proxies, just like HA proxy and Nginx. The choice of proxy varies. Linkerd uses a micro proxy, simply called Linkerd proxy, 
that we built specifically for the service mesh. Other meshes use different proxies. Envoy is a common choice. But the choice of proxy is an implementation detail. What do these proxies do? They proxy calls to and from the services, of course. Strictly speaking, they act as both proxies and reverse proxies, handling both incoming and outgoing calls. And they implement a feature set that focuses on the calls between services. This focus on traffic between services is what differentiates service mesh proxies from, say, API gateways or ingress proxies, which focus on calls from the outside world into the cluster as a whole. So that's the data plane. The control plane is simpler. It's a set of components that provide whatever machinery the data plane needs to act in a coordinated fashion, including service discovery, TLS certificate issuing, metrics aggregation, and so on. The data plane calls the control plane to inform its behavior. The control plane, in turn, provides an API to allow the user to modify and inspect the behavior of the data plane as a whole. Here's a diagram of Linkerd's control plane and data plane. You can see that the control plane has several different components, including a small Prometheus instance that aggregates metrics data from the proxies, as well as components such as destination, service discovery, identity, certificate authority, and public API web and CLI endpoints. The data plane, by contrast, is just a single Linkerd proxy next to an application instance. This is just the logical diagram. When deployed, you may end up with three replicas of each control plane component, but hundreds or thousands of data plane proxies. The Linkerd proxy containers actually run in the same pod as the application containers in a Kubernetes cluster. This pattern is known as a sidecar container. The architecture of a service mesh has a couple big implications. For one, since the proxy feature set is designed for service-to-service -service calls, the service mesh really only makes sense if your application is built as services. You could use it with a monolith, but it would be a whole lot of machinery to run a single proxy, and the feature set wouldn't be a great fit. Another consequence is that the service mesh is going to require lots and lots of proxies. In fact, Linkerd adds one Linkerd proxy per instance of every service. Some other mesh implementations add one proxy per node, host, or VM. It's a lot either way. This heavy use of proxies itself has a couple of implications. One, whatever these data plane proxies are, they'd better be fast. We are adding two proxy hops to every call, one on the client side and one on the server side. Two, also, the proxies need to be small and light. Each one will consume memory and CPU and this consumption will scale linearly with your application. Three, you're going to need a system for deploying and updating lots of proxies. You don't want to have to do this by hand. But, at least at the 10,000 feet level, that's really all there is to the service mesh. You deploy a ton of user space proxies to do stuff to internal service-to-service -service traffic and you use the control plane to change their behavior and to query the data they generate. Now let's move on to the why. Why does the service mesh make sense? If you're encountering the idea of service mesh for the first time, you can be forgiven if your first reaction is mild horror. The design of the service mesh means that not only does it add latency to your application, it also consumes resources and also introduces a whole bunch of machinery. One minute you are installing a service mesh, the next you are suddenly on the hook for operating hundreds or thousands of proxies. Why would anyone want to do this? There are two parts to the answer. The first 
is that the operational cost of deploying these proxies can be greatly reduced thanks to some other changes that are happening in the ecosystem. Lots more on that later. The more important answer is because this design is actually a great way to introduce additional logic into the system. That's not only because there are a ton of features you can add right there, but also because you can add them without changing the ecosystem. In fact, the entire service mesh model is predicated on this very insight, that in a multi-service system, regardless of what individual services actually do, the traffic between them is an ideal insertion point for functionality. For example, Linkerd, like most meshes, has a layer 7 feature set focused primarily on HTTP calls, including HTTP2 and gRPC. The feature set is broad, but can be divided into three classes. Reliability features, request retries, timeouts, canaries, traffic splitting, shifting, etc. Observability features, aggregation of success rates, latencies, and request volumes for each service or individual routes, drawing of service topology maps, etc. Security features, mutual TLS, access control, etc. Many of these features operate at the request level, hence the level 7 proxy. For example, if service foo makes an HTTP call to service bar, the Linkerd proxy on foo's side can load balance that call intelligently across all the instances of bar based on the observed latency of each one. It can retry the request if it fails and if it's idempotent. It can record the response code and latency, and so on. Similarly, the Linkerd proxy on bar's side can reject the call if it's not allowed, or is over the rate limit. It can record latency from its perspective, and so on. The proxies can do stuff at the connection level too. For example, Foo's Linkerd proxy can initiate a TLS connection and BAR's Linkerd proxy can terminate it. And both sides can validate the other's TLS certificate. This provides not just encryption between services, but a cryptographically secure form of service identity. Foo and BAR can prove they are who they say they are. Whether they are at the request or at the connection level, one important thing to note is that the features of Service Mesh are all operational in nature. There isn't anything in Linkerd about transforming the semantics of the request payload. For example, adding fields to a JSON blob or transforming a protocol buffer. This is an important distinction that touch on again when we talk about ESBs and middleware. So that's the set of features that the service mesh can provide. But why not just implement them directly in the application? Why bother with the proxies at all? Why is the service mesh a good idea? While the feature set is interesting, the core value of the service mesh is not actually in the features. After all, we could implement these features directly in the application themselves. In fact, we'll see later that this was the genesis of the service mesh. If I had to put it into a single sentence, the value of the service mesh comes down to this. The service mesh gives you features that are critical for running modern service-side software in a way that's uniform across your stack and decoupled from application code. Let's take that one bit at a time. Features that are critical for running modern server-side software. If you are building a transactional server-side application that is connected to the public internet and takes requests from outside world, and response to them within some short time frame. Think web apps, API server, and the bulk of modern server-side software. 
And if you are building this system as a collection of services which talk to each other in a synchronous fashion, and if you are continually modifying this software to add more functionality, and if you are tasked with keeping this system running even while you are modifying it, then congratulations, you are building modern server-side software. And all of those glorious features listed above actually turn out to be critical for you. The application must be reliable, it must be secure, and you must be able to observe what it's doing. And that's exactly what the service mesh helps with. Okay, I snuck an opinion in there. That this approach is the modern way to build server-side software. There are people in the world today who are building monoliths or reactive microservices and other things that don't fit into the definition above who hold a different opinion. Uniform across your stack. The features provided by the service mesh aren't just critical. They apply to every service in your application, regardless of what language the service is written in, what framework it uses, who wrote it, how it was deployed, or any other detail of development or deployment. Decoupled from application code. Finally, the service mesh doesn't just provide features uniformly across your stack. It does so in a way that requires no application chains. The fundamental ownership of the service mesh functionality, including the operational ownership of configuration, updates, operation, maintenance, etc., lies purely at the platform level, independent of the application. The application can change without the service mesh being involved and the service mesh can change without the application being involved. In short, not only does the service mesh provide vital features, it does so in a way that's global, uniform, and independent of the application. And so while, yes, the features of the service mesh could be implemented in the service code, even as a library that was linked in to every service, this approach would not provide the decoupling and uniformity that's at the heart of the service mesh value prop. And all you have to do is add a lot of proxies. I promise that we are going to talk about the operational cost of adding all of these proxies very soon. But first, we need a pit stop to examine this idea of decoupling from the perspective of people. You just listened to part one of the service mesh, what every software engineer needs to know about the world's most overhyped technology by William Morgan of Boyant.io Listen to part 2 on the next episode. And if you're looking for software and cloud development services and training, check out softwarable.com. We help customers in their software and cloud journey, whether it is taking software from ideas to complete solutions, migrating existing systems to the cloud, or mentoring and training individuals and teams. We make it work for your needs. Go to softwarable.com, that's software without the E, I B L E, dot com, to learn more. Now let's check the tool of the day. Today's tool is Kubelinter. It analyzes Kubernetes YAML files and Helm charts and checks them against a variety of best practices with a focus on production readiness and security. Kubelinter runs sensible default checks designed to give you useful information about your Kubernetes YAML files and Helm charts. This is to help teams check early and often for security misconfigurations and DevOps best practices. Some common examples of these include running containers as a non-root user, enforcing least privilege, and storing sensitive information only in secrets. Kubelinter is configurable, so you can enable and disable checks, as well as create your own custom checks. Depending on the policies you want to follow, within your organization. When a lint check fails, Kubelinter reports recommendations 
for how to resolve any potential issues and returns a non-zero exit code. Search for kubelinter on GitHub or find the link to it in the description of this episode. And that should do it for another episode of Software Bell Bytes. Have a great rest of your day and I'll see you here again in the next episode.